Mumbai has lots of construction going on. So, so it feels like um, I have an appropriate symbol for my talk, um, which is the fact that Mumbai is always under construction. And so maybe I chose a good title for my talk here today. Let's see if I can get it. Um, there was a time, I, I'm beginning now, no, I'd say. Um, there was a time, um, say, how long ago? Well, a decade or two ago, when you'd see this sign a lot on websites around the internet. Um, and the thing I realized in looking back and thinking about it was that it's a great symbol of, of our naivety at believing we could ever finish something. Because we created all these websites, and so many of them, and I, for one, am definitely to, to blame, would stick these little signs on and say, don't worry, I'll be finished sometime soon. Um, and a few years later, we kind of gave up putting those signs on our websites because we realized we were never going to finish them. But my talk today um, is, oops, let's try to get this over here. My talk today is about the fact that, yes, we gave up putting those stickers on our websites, saying that they were going to be always under construction because we didn't want to reveal to people that we thought they might be finished. But in many ways, the way in which we still design and build and commission websites and software still seems to have this logo on it. We still, in many ways, assume that we're going to finish our software. And then when people commission a website, they're going to get a product and they can launch it. That's the end. Uh, and I think we should do our best to dispel that myth. But the development community, the agencies, and the clients, commission organizations, are all guilty at maintaining this risk, this myth, that we can finish and deliver a finished product. And um, so I'm here today to tell you a bit about my explorations over the last few years. Uh, since I realized that this is a problem for, for me and my own team, um, and the kind of things that we've explored to, to change this policy, to actually plan for sites that we're never going to finish, and what were the things we're going to put in place to do. So I, I hope I can talk today to people who might run Drupal businesses, might be agencies that commission Drupal businesses, or might be organizations that might commission a Drupal website, and provide some kind of insight into um, the kind of things we should be aware of and the kind of practices we can put in place to assist us with uh, websites where we give up on the idea that we can finish them. And we take these stickers off our project management processes and uh, our leaflets or whatever else we use to, to convince people that, don't oh, worry, you'll be finished one day. So uh, my name is Peter Brono. I have come from London. Um, I work with a company called Code Positive, which I'm a director of, although I'm, today I'm officially an explainer. I try not to be the official title. Um, I've been a developer for 30 years, 20 of them professionally, and started organizing meetups in London almost exactly 10 years ago. So um, I'm hoping if I get the headspace to organize our 10th anniversary meetup uh, on the 17th of March next month, uh, that's committing it in public. Doing it. Um, uh, I have, yeah, so now this is a, this slide where I try to establish my credibility and tell you all the things that I've done so that you think you can believe the rest of my talk. So I, I built a, a, an internet startup, a Drupal based internet startup. Uh, we raised a million pounds, worked for five years, sold it for a pound. So failed um, internet startup, but you know, I learned a lot from that. I learned not to build startups in Drupal. Yeah, I'm going to say that up front. It's, it's not the right tool. I don't, uh, it was five years of, of, of lots of education for me. Um, my recent project has been to establish a Drupal apprenticeship program in the UK. Uh, it actually is now a um, government recognized qualification that is a foundation level three in Drupal. Um, and we have, it's been going for about three years. And we got a, a good number of 18 to 23 year olds coming through the program. And you know, it's been very exciting. Um, apart from Drupal stuff, I, I run a charity. Uh, I run an artist so studios. I've been an artist. I've been a, an activist. Um, I you know, have 
way too many different things that I try to do with my time. Uh, one day I hope to learn to sleep. Um, anyway, that's enough about me. Um, let's get back to uh, the talk. So, until possibly two or three years ago, maybe a bit longer, um, but I find evidence of it on the website a few years ago. Um, when you Google for Drupal, uh, Google, um, Drupal's, yeah? Oh, <laughs> okay. If you Google for Drupal, you would get the, uh, Drupal's tagline being community plumbing. And for many, this was something I didn't quite understand, but for me, I felt that this, and I still feel, that it's one of the best descriptions of what Drupal actually does. Um, Drupal provides that infrastructure, um, that plumbing, and in the early days, it was focused on communities and allowing people to communicate and work together. I think these days, although we've taken the slogan off the website, now we pretend, to, well, now we are far more business focused, I think that community plumbing is still part of Drupal's core. It, it has built us, it's our foundations. But I think we've got bigger than that now. And so I would like to say that Drupal now provides organizational infrastructure. Um, it really is the, the infrastructure that can support organizations in their day-to-day -day operations. Um, and I think that the, the, this infrastructure kind of work is the ideal place for Drupal. Small websites, there are many other competitors. Um, I often don't see a need to build a blog in Drupal. I don't. Um, if you can build it in WordPress, use WordPress. Um, I've said before, you don't, I don't want to build a, a startup in Drupal because a startup needs refined control of every piece of uh, the UX. And with Drupal, you know, with Drupal, you spend more time taking features out of Drupal rather than putting them in. But this sweet spot, this ideal situation where you want to provide a constantly evolving, reliable website that can adapt to an organization's environment um, with new features coming in a very regular interval. Now that's something that Drupal does. And I think that we can really achieve that and make Drupal um, the ideal tool for providing tools for organizations to run their daily business. If we establish good practices and methodologies that allow us to do that. But what's more, I think we as developers, agencies, and Clients all need to be aware of the real lifespan of our projects. We cannot pretend that they finish at launch. If we build projects and plan them according to a launch date, we simply cannot effectively prioritize the work we need to do to make our sites really last. Um, and so, yes, we fail to get the real return on investment if we do not take a long-term view from the start. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to cover some of the theory of that long-term view, talk about some of the practical elements that we try to do as a development team, talk about some of the ways in which we've had to evolve beyond being a development team in order to help the organizations we work with actually deal with the time scales we talk about. And um, then end briefly on uh, things that Dries was touching on this morning in his keynote, the fact that we're moving to this fourth revolution where everyone needs some form of infrastructure and the digital, um, some form of digital infrastructure. We have to be able to teach our organizations to adapt to this new digital age. And Drupal could very well be the right tool for helping us power that. And that's what Dries was touching on in his talk today. So, Yes, this idea of organizational infrastructure. Um, organizations need digital tools to help them do their, their work, their business. Um, they don't have to be businesses, and the websites don't have to necessarily be internal, external. They just need to be the tools that support the day-to-day -day operations. So a marketing company might need better tools to allow it to measure and improve its marketing. A, um, a solar power company it might need uh, better tools for managing the, its internal operations and its solar farms, that sort of thing. All this kind of work requires that we are able to build a tool to solve a problem. And that tool solving a problem changes the problem 
And then we have to build a new tool to solve a different problem, because we now have a symbiotic relationship between the software and the business. Um, and yes, so we have to constantly update these sites to changing requirements, because, um, well, we change the requirements by building a lot of release of our software. Now, I've ended up discovering that we've actually been building, um, on my team's been building this kind of site for quite a long time. Um, our Drupal consultancy has been going for almost 10 years, nine years. Um, and for a lot of that time, we've had the same clients. They've stayed with us for a very long period of time. And the sites we've been building started to actually have a lifespan way longer than I was willing to actually admit when I began this project. And now I've come to be the conclusion that if I'm working with a large organization and they need a site that they're going to use to support their operations, I need to start planning my website to last for seven years. It seemed way longer than I expected, I said, no, but I did it. And really, I built my start for five years, and that was only just beginning. I have worked with some of the organizations um, that are currently my clients. Um, for on, on these websites, which have already been going for four years, and we're beginning. So um, seven years may <coughs> seem like a big number at first, but in practice, I feel it's the the age for a decent website uh, for, with longevity that we should be aiming for. Um, the thing is that because we don't actually see this whole lifespan, we don't begin saying, all right, let me build a website that's going to last that long and work with my clients to understand that this website needs to keep evolving for that length of time because there's no launch. It's not <coughs> the launch is the beginning, it's not the end. And so from the moment we launch, we're going to const constantly want to add features and change those features. Um, if we don't take that whole lifespan into account, we are building the landfill. So if we build, no matter how good our development practices, no matter how much care we take over each line of code, we're building <coughs> rush because it's going to go into the bin. We will not be able to serve the needs of the organizations we are trying to serve. So how many here use some form of agile methodology? Okay. Yeah, a good proportion of us. Um, and agile is in many ways created that problem. Um, this is a graph that shows the traditional cost of change in a waterfall uh, software design program. And, and it's pretty simple. Um, there are many graphs that I put on this, but essentially the later in a project that a change request comes in, the more expensive that change is to implement. And if you have a project that must now last for seven years with change requests coming in at every point, uh, possibly every month, even every <coughs> week, in that lifespan, for the entire lifespan of that project. That's not a very good one. It means that the older your site is, the more and more expensive it gets to maintain. Which means that you never get to seven years. You get somewhere around three years, and you throw it all away, and you start again. Because the cost of change just gets too high. So in his book on extreme programming, Ken Beck published this graph as his ideal. And he claimed that extreme programming, which was one of the methodologies that came to the fore we classified what agile was, he claimed that extreme programming could achieve this graph where the cost of change became constant. Most people tend to say it's not quite that nice. It still does go up over time. But in practice, that's our goal. That's the, the holy grail of the, the agile methodologies, is to achieve a cost of change graph that looks as much like that as possible. Um, and if we are going to build sites that must last almost a decade, we, we definitely have to aim for that kind of graph. So, the, well, what this means is, if you're going to build long-term projects, you need to have some form of good agile practice to manage that. There are ways around it. You can have, you know, you don't have to have a, a you, you can, you can make up your own, but essentially, you need to know that lowering the cost of change is your goal. 
And if, you, if the systems that you evolve and the, the various bits of different methodologies that you adopt for your team do not achieve that goal, you get rid of them and you try again. Because you have to continuously aim towards lowering your cost of change. That is essentially what the Agile methodologies were created for, and they still need to aim towards that. And within Drupal, because we're not a purely code-based system, we have to manage configuration, and um, there's various layers that are not always effectively you know, captured in code, <coughs> we, we may have to adapt the Agile methodologies to fit our environment. Um, and that's fine. Agile methodologies need to be adaptable. That's their point. As long as you remember that mantra, lower the cost of change. Um, so, it's the get launch. That's, I'm gonna, I, that, that is one of my mantras. Um, because the moment you start having someone say, what happens at launch? Where in, and you start planning projects for launch, there's no reason why you should use any form of ag agile methodology at all. In most cases, you do not see any return on investment on, from an agile methodology if your project ends at launch. There's no reason for you to build tests. There's no reason for you to have naming conventions or standardize your building plan. There's no reason to document. There's no reason to bother about anyone else maintaining your code after you because launch is the end. That's all I care about. I'm going to deliver the most effective project for launch. Do not use Agile. It's simple. But if you can forget about launch, and from the start, you're able to convince your team and your clients that their site will last for approximately seven years, then suddenly you can prioritize the things that make your site last. You can take time to build your related test programs. You can take time to establish a good style guide. You can take time to do all those things, which make Agile far more expensive in the beginning than it is at the end. So what we do in Agile is we front load all the difficult stuff. And we do all the things that allow us to change their run. Um, Agile does not mean fast. I think that's the mistake that people make when they step into this. Agile is not fast. It allows you to change. Agile, in many ways, is slower than a waterfall-based project because we have to build the tests. We have to come up with standards. We have to come up with ways for our team to work together. But um, yes, there's no reason to do any of those things if we haven't convinced our clients that you have to think about the long-term maintainability of your work. Um, so, yes. Understand and welcome change. That's become my mantra while uh, producing this talk. Um, in the Agile Manifesto, the second point happens to you know, make that very clear. We must welcome changing requirements even late in development at any point. Um, and Agile processes harness change, and we make that an advantage. Um, and yeah, I, I love studying how things change. Uh, it, it really is my a personal and spiritual mantra as much as it is my professional mantra. Um, and, you know, it is a, a, I haven't got the Pali mantra for my meditation, but you know, it is essentially uh, my focus. So I would love to get to this next stage of my talk and now show you some great examples of websites that my team has built that have used all my um, theories and all these things we've developed and built something really good, yeah, but I can't. Because, unfortunately, um, I have learned many of these lessons the hard way. First of all, um, we lost, well, we lost a major client where I had to hand over a different agency, and I realized all the things we didn't do uh, that we should have done when you go and give someone else all your work. Uh, then, at almost the same time, we had a giant agency um, well, we, we were then asked to take over a multinational website that had been produced by a giant agency, and we got to look at all the things that they had done wrong that stopped us from being able to take over and maintain their work. And this got me thinking quite seriously about what are the best practices and the things we need to do. First of all, to allow for some form of continuity, even if you change development teams. And I think that's, for me, one of the biggest holes in, in our organizational approach to <coughs> websites and especially continuity, um, we don't ever plan for the one thing that's probably going to happen. You're going to change the people. 
um, and we have very few plans. So this next section covers some development uh, <coughs> processes that we've adopted as a team, things we've learned about. We've also not necessarily implemented all of these for each project. Uh, as we've come in rescuing a number of different websites, um, we've you know, learned a few things and found some things were more important for that particular stage of the project and um, tried them out. Um, we've been through a few iterations. What I'm going to share with you now are things that are our current theories. Um, and no, they may change. So this is the first important truth uh, when exploring the esoteric nature of change um, in any form, is that change itself is consistent. And any system that is coherent actually has consistent ways in which things change. So if we are to build a system that allows us to manage change and reduce that cost of change, we must be consistent. That's, uh, there isn't any way around that. We have to make sure that the work we do is consistent. Um, and so it needs to work across all team members. Again, um, another uh, of the extreme programming methodology so, um, little slogans. Extreme programming has lots of little slogans, and I, I have enjoyed them. And one of the, the best ones, one I use the most, says, you can program any way you like, but not with us. Um, and, and that's very true. Your team needs to try to make sure that each team member works in the same way on the same side. Not just at the same time, but over time. Um, you need to make sure that your sites are built in consistent ways, in consistent patterns. Solve the same problem in the same way with the same tools. Um, and then make sure you document how you solve that problem. So that next time you solve that problem, you solve it in the same way. Even better than that, plan the pattern for solving your problems up front. And if you start with a style guide for your website, which is another very important pattern that we have learned the hard way, uh, makes life much easier if you want to make Right. Build a style guide right at the very beginning and obey your style guide. It's just one of those simple tools that allows you to build a maintainable website. Um, the thing with, and if you, if you look at the atomic style guides that say first define the small bits and go up to how they group into large elements, you define all the various patterns that you'll use to build your website. How do you list things? How do you display alerts? How do you provide a teaser? How do you filter? Working out all those molecules of your atomic style guide will then allow you then to define before you build anything. Um, okay, we're going to solve this problem using views, contexts, and blocks. Or we're going to use this one using patterns. And you can actually define the pattern when you solve the problems before you start building the website. And I know in many agile schools we're not supposed to try to do too much upfront design because it can be a waste. But in Drupal, perhaps we have um, some peculiarities that we need to adapt to. And Drupal is one of those systems where experience makes a hell of a lot of difference on programming in general. But with Drupal, the knowledge of the systems, the knowledge of the patterns, um, means that you can have a exponentially different implementations. And also, Drupal experience is rare. So if you have a multidiscipline team with multiple uh, different levels of skill, we, are, we find that having your lead developers go ahead, look at the patterns, define how those problems should be solved, and pass those on to more junior members of the team, you're able to yes, effectively manage consistency without going on and having different people hacking at things just because they didn't know better and, and there wasn't someone around to ask a question saying, how do I solve this? They went on and did it. Get, you know, don't don't just build things. Build it the way everyone else does on the team. Um, and yes, the other interesting thing with patterns is each pattern, each website that you build may end up having its own set of patterns. And you have to make sure that when people build on a website, they use the website's patterns, not their own patterns. And, it, and so your consistency across all team members within the specific context of the subject we're working on. Um, and patterns feel really hard to document. We don't know where to start. 
we, we say, should I do this, should I be that, uh, should I try all the steps, or do I talk about design? Um, I can't answer those questions because they also depend very much on your team, but the best answer is have an easy place to have documentation um, and use it. So when someone builds something, make some notes. Start at a high level. Just say, all right, we do this, we've done that, done that. And then every time you use a pattern, drill down. Um, we've tried wikis, we've tried also things. We have now, finally, uh, although we resisted for many years, we've adopted Confluence, um, which is one of the Glassian products, because it just allowed us to work very quickly and uh, the different interconnections between uh, documentation that we needed uh, without anyone complaining that oh, it was too hard and I don't like wiki syntax and I've lost my index and, and Confluence did solve those problems for us and our documentation has improved since we adopted it. Um, now, this one is something that has, um, I found, well, yeah, has risen its ugly head a few times in my sort of recent projects. And that when you take over someone else's work, and they have some level of automation for how they deploy, how they might test things. If you were not part of that team, and, all, and, and that team happened to then go away, and it took all their processes with them, and you're left with this website that obviously has processes and tools, but you have no access to them. And so if a organization is going to be able to plan for the fact that it, has the, it should have the right to change development teams at some point. Um, the organization that commissions the website must own the tools and the infrastructure to test and automate that website. Um, you can't, as a development team, say, I oh, know we can use all our tools, I'm gonna give you this website, um, because we're not, that's not a very open source-y kind of thing. You know, we might be trying to lock in our clients to, to our processes, but really if we want to be in the spirit of, of open source and actually give our clients the right service and plan for their continuity in case we decide we don't want to work with them anymore. Because that's also the other important thing. Some clients are just not worth having, right? So, so you want to be able to leave them and still be nice and say, great, we built your website and here are all the tools for you to maintain the website, goodbye. Um, so it's a good investment to make sure that we set up the tools for our clients. But um, yes, making sure that we say, here's a website, and here are all the tools that support the website, um, provided in some form that um, the client can own themselves. You know, the Git repository should not be hosted on your web service. Of course, you can move it around, but ideally, give the client a Git repository and say, that's yours. Maintain it, uh, or at least look after it. We're going to use it, but it's yours. Um, the, the documentation should not be something that sits on your servers. Luckily, with things like Confluence, that's how you can easily export it and say, great. We'll put it over there. So you can, can find the, uh, the between the two. Make sure you can at least import, export, or hand over um, the tools. Because I do think organizations that start taking their websites as supporting platform seriously are going to have to insist that they're able to survive the change of supply. Um, and within the UK government and all, all this sort of thing where there's been a major push to you small enterprises, not IBM and the large corporations, their entire push, this amazing energy to say, let's break the stranglehold of the big consulting firms and use small business to build our software, has kind of fizzled out because the small businesses could not cope with the continuity of suppliers. They could not allow, first of all, different teams to work on the same projects. They couldn't allow, could not allow someone to change suppliers because the problem with small businesses is they sometimes go out of business. Um, and all these government projects ran into incredible amounts of trouble trying to manage lots of small teams that could not offer them any kind of continuity. Once they deliver the project, they will quit. And so, unfortunately, I think the UK is very much moving back towards IBM, because IBM solves some level of continuity. Um, and continuity for any large organization or government um, department is critical, and we have to solve that problem. Um, so, I'm going to step one level down. Let's talk about the things that your team cannot not do. You know, we can get away with some form of um, you know, lot of documentation, and we can sometimes teach things uh, and, and, and recover from some of these other processes. But 
we can't not do these things if we want to have some level of you know, reducing that cost of change for any website. So you have to make your changes deployable. And Drupal has made this hard. You know, features is a pain. Um, and, and if you get obsessed about making sure that every single bit of your config is caught in a feature or in code, you're probably breaking the rule of making your change cheaper. You're spending, you can spend days trying to automate something that will take you five seconds. So, so don't obsess about continu continuous integration. It's not that important. What's more important is repeatable process. You must be able to say, we have got this work, it's on this server, it's now moving to that server. Achieve that in a way that makes it doable, repeatable, and as cheap as possible. And bit by bit, automate it. Man, we gave up obsessing over CI uh, and full automation a long time ago because I, I lost years from my, of my life trying to solve some more problems. Um, and then you have to do some form of automated testing. You can't have a website that um, is going to last for a long period of time where you build features three years ago and you haven't come back to them and suddenly something breaks. But you haven't looked at that for a few years. Um, if you haven't got a way to test that, you got, first of all, you're probably not going to fix it, and secondly, you're probably not going to know it's broken in the first place. So, automated testing is vital. The problem is that Drupal's simple tests tend to be rather hard, especially if you were trying to get your junior developers or junior builders who didn't know any coding, but they can easily implement a package. They can build the views, do that, they can produce the features, but suddenly building some features and then say, great, now go write an object-oriented simple test to test that feature. That, there's a big disconnect. And so you end up just not doing that bit. So, um, not quite by accident, but uh, almost. Uh, we started our apprenticeship program. And one of the first things we did on the apprenticeship program for these, these guys who had, in many cases, never used a computer or never done any program before, had been a, a very light exposure, we very quickly got them onto trying on Bahat. And Bahat is a natural language. Natural language is pushing the same. It's a simple language that allows you to script um, a flow through a website, clicking on things and making sure things exist. And really, it took a matter of days for someone with no programming knowledge to pick up Bahat. And within a week, they were doing productive work that we could sell. Um, so it really, if you haven't got some kind of automated testing, just try that. Find someone who has a very basic knowledge of, of programming sites, try it. it is, it's horribly documented. Um, it's, there are some horrible little learning curves to it, and you do need someone who can do some, some debugging to sit down and read some arcane docs and solve some of the more difficult problems. But in practice, if you have an experienced person on call, the hat allows you to establish a testing department with an organization within days. Um, and it, uh, you know, you will rewrite those tests many times. And the testing process is one that will evolve and, um, and grow, but um, it is still a very valuable, very good. And I do recommend trying. So I'm going to start moving away from the, the, the nitty gritty of a development team. I can go on for quite a while talking about the little things we tried and things that have failed. Um, but actually, I realized at some point when I we were kind of beginning this, this journey of trying to work out how to build these sites that lasted. Uh, um, um, yeah, we, I, I went through a bit of an, an epiphany. Um, and I was sitting with a client before a sprint. And we're doing the work we normally tend to do for free. Um, we'd, we'd take a, an afternoon, sit down with the client, go through their ideas, and filter out which stories we should look at, which ones we should focus on, and come up with a set of stories we should include in the sprint. No. Um, we thought this was just set up, we charged a fixed sprint rate, and so this was just a, you know, a little bit that we never really measured at the beginning of the sprint. But after one of these meetings, I sat down and looked at all the ideas that they really, really wanted, and I now convinced them we're not worth while investing. And realized that we could have charged them you know, tens of thousands of pounds to do that work. But we told them not to. 
And we told them to go for a much smaller factory of work. And I realized that, hang on, I've just taken all this work out of my company for free. Um, and then I get started understanding, looking at, well, looking at this process and going, well, maybe if I just saved my client 30, 40,000 pounds in this one afternoon, maybe I should start charging for this service. And so I started looking at the various things that we did as a team. Um, and especially the things we did for free we thought were obvious. And I tried to turn around the pyramid and say, well, if I thought that was the bottom, what if that's the actual service? And so I turned it around. Because one of the things that you're trying to do to reduce the cost of change is actually you know, reduce the amount of change. You're trying to do the right changes at the right times. And this process of telling your client, look, that's a silly feature, it's a waste of money, um, let's get out of there, is a very important part of managing the cost of change over time. If you want your site to last, you, know, you need to make sure that you put the right features in, and if those features aren't working, take them out again. So that process of refining your feature mix stable site is very important and it is very valuable. So because we were development focused, we thought that code was our product, we didn't realize that we were working with organizations that in many ways needed far more than our code. They really needed our advice and our understanding of this digital domain. And again, going back to Dries's keynote this morning, this whole process of companies need to be agile companies needing to adapt to the digital revolution, um, they, they really do need help. And the people who give them the help happen to be the people who've been part of the digital, digital revolution for quite a while, the developers, the teams. We just have to start communicating what we do in code to the people who are thinking about this in terms of businesses. Um, and so, yes, I went through the things that we did. And I found a few of the things that we did for free, things we thought were obvious, and I started turning them into things that we could sell. Uh, and that I realized what consultants do. You know, a consultant is telling people things that you think are obvious and making them pay lots of money. Um, so, so yes, we became consultants in this process. Uh, and the process of becoming consultants really took its own uh, course. And so we suddenly started doing consultancy kind of things because you know, we couldn't really do our programming job if we didn't fix these things in the organization first. So I'm going to now talk about a few of the steps we've taken to help our clients um, actually give us the right kind of work so that we can do a good job. Um, and one of the things that we realized after de delivering this great big you know, report of all these things that people could do, and you know, a seven-year plan. You know, we, we really got in there and tried to help someone look at this long-term plan for their website. No one read it. Um, it, it was, you know, it was dense, and we put so much effort into it, and they didn't care. Um, and then we did this again for a different client, but we we also gave them a picture, uh, and they loved the picture. You know, um, and then we realized what well, we were doing the wrong thing. We we're still talking developer speak. Uh, to the non-developers, and what we have to do is stories. And we have to tell people simpler stories that follow some kind of story arc that they can understand. Um, because, yes, the, you know, our clients often are not interested in the nitty gritty of we want this feature there, this feature there. Some people do care, but they care about their feature. And they want to see that on their plan. They don't, want to, they don't really care about the entire plan. So, when you are starting to communicate with your clients, you start telling them that, that you're going to have this long-term plan for their website, you're going to guide them through maintaining and building the system over a period of years, tell them stories <coughs> of pictures. Um, and one of the nice little story arcs that I found that, I, um, that helps, when you're telling people about a long lifespan of a website, is saying that a website goes through a series of phases. And in each phase, you're going to prioritize the right set of features. So, um, you know, the first phase is, is birth. The website gets born, and you, you, you start developing the basic structure and the essential elements of that website. Then, at the end of that first phase, you might have you know, that, that launch thing, which is the, where you open it up to um, actual users. And that's the point in which you start to actually define what it is this website's supposed to do. Because you had this idea, you had a whole set of assumptions um, that were probably wrong. 
and you try them out, and you get them up there at the index in that first phase, and, and you realize, ah, oh, okay, people didn't want to want that, they wanted this. And so you go through this process of what I call definition, where you say, ah, you know, this is what we're doing. And you actually manage to define, say clear, more clearly, what you're trying to achieve with your website. And you've, you've validated a few of the assumptions. Then you go through the process of, um, once you understand this, and, and the definition process might take a year. You know, it might be this whole a year or two as you go through this process of working out what we're doing, you're trying different features, by the getting to the point where you say, all right, we now have a good idea of the kind of service we want to do. At that point, you then have to go back and try to communicate that again to all the people who are using your website. So you then start restructuring information. So the third phase tends to be one about they can say, ah, our product page is wrong. Let's redesign those. Let's, let's fix this up. Let's, let's make it clearer. Um, and, and then you get to the process of saying, ah, we've got all this stuff, and we've actually got now you know, good content, but you're not easily getting from this one to this one to this one to this one. And so the fourth phase um, is often one of building strong connections between content. You start really refining your taxonomies, finding ways to, to stop people from reaching near those dead end pages. Or you can plan them a bit up front. Really, it takes watching your stats and watching how people use your website to really see how these different um, bits connect together and how you can give people real um, insight into topics by connecting the dots in different ways. Um, and, and that comes near the end of, a, of that natural lifespan of sites. And, and by that point where you realize, ah, oh, we, we can do all these new things, we can connect these things in new ways, that's the point at which people normally start thinking about their, their next website because they, they've learned all these lessons. And, you need to reincarnate in some form. It's a very esoteric approach to telling a story about a website. It's very unscientific. But I don't think it's entirely wrong. Some websites will follow a different kind of flow. But the point is, tell a story. That story doesn't have to be true, it can be a myth. But it's just a way to help someone see that there are certain priorities and the kinds of features you should put on the website. Um, and that you can. Um, so that when you do have the organization where everyone wants their feature to be plugged in tomorrow, you can say, well, no, we're going to look at that kind of feature next year. And then that might fend them off for a few months. You can say, well, no, next year. And you know, eventually you then realize that you might have a feature that you know, you'd be able to do some kind of thing. Um, the other thing I've realized, and this might be particularly important for Drupal, where we're doing far more than just code. We're working with code layer, configuration layer, uh, a process of choosing the right modules, managing how those modules get updated. Um, we, we really need to become stewards. We need to serve our clients and look after their assets. Because our clients love destroying their website. Uh, that's, that's somehow just the way it is. They, get, they go and spend a lot of money, and then they mess it all up. Um, and we have to find some way to guide them through this process. You know, and not just saying yes to everything you want. We have to become stewards and, and actually tell them, well, no, you were, you were trying to do this. Um, and so to do that, you shouldn't do that. You need to do this instead. Um, and that's another consulting thing that we used to do for free. But now, being able to go along and say, well, let's, let's test your assumptions. You know, the idea of uh, you know, the, the lean startup movement and be able to take the ideas of assumptions, testing them, and analytics. It's a great book to read. I do recommend if you want to take on any kind of stewardship and looking after your clients. The, the lean startup is a great, give you a set of tools to go and convince your clients that you shouldn't just jump in there. You need to say no first, work out what you're trying to do, and have a, a process to go through before you add things to your website. Um, but yes, there are a few different layers to the work we need to do for code, manage their product. Um, and this is this area which I'm going to get into next, where we've had this idea of a product owner within the Agile uh, system. But the product owner kind of represents the client and it's still very dev team focused. It's still very much about what the development team do. We want this, you have the stories, yes, the story should work with this. And so the challenge with that in many dev teams is that the, the user experience tends to be something that's kind of left out because oh, I'll get this module, we plug it in there, and, and the, the dev team's focus is on the code, and the product owner is, is more on the business, and so there are lots of elements that get missed out. And so 
there is a growing community of product managers, which is the next step up of product owners, which actually engage in these different things. And um, we should, we found that it'd been very valuable for us to establish project product management as a key service of our clients. And then the idea of governance, um, and how where we try to tell our clients that this website, this tool we built you, needs to last. And in order for it to last, you have to approach it in certain ways. And you have to request features in specific ways according to processes. And you have to follow the style guide. And actually, the process of documenting and trying to enforce, trying, because it's very hard to make this, trying to enforce their governance. Um, is something that if we don't take on that role, no one's going to do it. Uh, it's very rare that you'll find someone in an organization who's really willing to stand up to their boss and say, I am not going to implement your feature. You know, it, we, it, people just want to say yes to their boss. Um, and we have to help them say that. So um, let's check my time. OK. So um, I have far less time than I want. So, I'll touch on a few things. Product management, um, yes, it's more than product owner. The product manager sits at the intersection of business, UX, and tech. It's a very challenging role. Um, but it's something that, if you work with large organizations for long-lasting websites, I feel is vital. Um, one of the interesting things with this kind of platform infrastructure website is that you, know, you may have an internal development team, or you might have an external development team, but you're not going to have necessarily have <coughs> continuous rolling sprints. You might have sprints that happen every two months or every three months. Um, but the organization doesn't want to stop planning its website, stop coming up with ideas in the period where there's no development team directly there. So one of the product managers' roles is to understand what programmers do. They may not necessarily be a program, but they need to understand HTML and CSS and code and know the principles. They need to understand the business. They need to understand UX. And so they, are, they work within the organization or with the organization to help them keep evolving their ideas while there's no sprint happening, um, or while there's no sprint in, in the immediate future. Um, and their job is collecting ideas and making sure that they are collected in the right way to pass on to the development team. And then refining them and having discussions about them so that by the time the stories and the acceptance criteria get to the development team, they're in the right format and they're being thought through and they're actually meeting the right business goals. Um, whereas you can often, in the scrum process, with just with an owner, end up overwhelmed by a giant backlog uh, of badly written stories and it, it can be hell. And you really have no idea how to prioritize them effectively. And, and so that product management is not like pulling that away from the development team. It's not separating, it's not saying, plan your software and give us a spec. It's just about establishing the stories in an agile manner, but independently from the development team, so it can evolve in its own way. Um, and yes, there's a growing community of, of people exploring product management. Uh, there are meetups all around the world, and it's definitely something to have a look at. We've started using a website called ProdPad, um, and it ties in with Jira and those other tools. It, it, we use it to have these discussions with our clients. So, uh, what, I, what your idea is, get some mock-ups, you know, writing up the stories, our bad acceptance criteria, they'll come through and then when, and then we use that to manage our roadmap. Um, one of the things we managed to do, it took a long time, a lot of work, was get our clients to actually say, uh, all right, we're going to do a sprint every two months um, for the next year. So we actually put the sprints in the calendar along in advance. Each of our sprints then has a theme and a focus, and, the, and within ProdPad, um, we manage that roadmap, collecting their ideas, putting them together, so that ideally, two months before we even start a planning sprint, we've had enough time to discuss and refine what our clients want in that sprint. Um, and that's been very good at reducing the stress, of, uh, finally getting to that week before our sprint and realizing, ah, oh, they, haven't, they haven't clarified that, they haven't answered these questions, this process of um, just giving ourselves a lot of runway and months in advance collecting these tools, according to roadmap, um, has, has been very valuable. Um, so yes, the idea of you know, having rules and processes for managing feature requests 
is something that many people are very opposed to. Um, it is doable, it can be done. Uh, it just takes the right level of buy-in from, um, from the boss. And you know, ideally, you get right at the top, you get the, you know, whoever the top to say, yes, we are gonna establish some processes and that is how we protect our investment. Um, generally, if you, come get, if you keep focusing on the money <coughs> for these guys, it's like, look, you are investing a lot of money over the next many years in this website. Don't screw it up. You know? And you don't screw it up by saying, you know, do things in this way and sticking to those rules. Um, of course, you can still screw it up, um, but it can reduce that, um, that possibility. So, um, yeah, the, the, the man I propose that you look up and read um, is Paul Bogue. Um, he is in the UK, he's got a number of books that are very valuable um, at sort of helping you understand and helping your clients understand what websites actually do. Um, and one of the things he does very well um, is get people to build their service manual, which is the manual that says, okay, we are the development world. We are the owners within the company of the website. And we do this, this is our mandate, and this is how you'll, uh, you should request things, and here's our style guide, and just communicating within the organization what the web team does, whether they be just a product owner representative within the organization, um, or, or action team itself, and, and how they work, just making sure that that is clear. And in practice, the easiest way to enforce something is just to make it clear. We've written, we've drawn flowcharts, and we've done all these things, but it's only when we drew pictures that people started paying attention. So, you know, tell a story, use pictures, uh, try to make it nice. Uh, that's the only way people seem to pay attention when you start telling them things, and then they are very happy. If you've just said, I'm, you know, we're in charge, you're going to do th this like this, and here's the comic book that explains it, generally people are much more willing to go and say, okay, we'll obey your process until they want their feature tomorrow. Um, and, and that's when you know, having the, the backup from upper management to help you is there. Anyway, um, the other things that we found was amazingly valuable is that we went to one of our clients and they said, can you fix our website? Uh, and after looking at the website and looking at the way they were managing it, we just said, no, but we'll help you fix your organization. And this is where we suddenly took that next step up to being consultants at another level. And we took their, their company mission statement of what they were doing. We said, you, nothing in there represents what you want to do online. Let's work together and come up with a digital mission statement. And we got the company together in a one day workshop and we got them to say, this is what we want to achieve online. And this is a, it's a charity that um, really depended on the website. The website defined that. And yet, their mission statement mentioned, mentioned nothing about the website. Um, and so there was a complete disconnect. And in doing that, we were able to very effectively uh, start engaging <coughs> with how they worked and are then able to actually start dealing with some of the technical problems because they knew what they wanted to achieve. We helped them establish some processes and you know, staging infrastructure and testing infrastructure and document that. And then finally we started solving some of the technical problems. Um, but it would have been much harder and close to impossible and we wouldn't have actually done them any service apart from make the problem worse if we hadn't actually taken the time to work out what they want to achieve. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm two minutes over. I'm going to do a, my final conclusion. Um, and the thing that I have learned in this process of trying to assist people to understand and manage change over time is that it really is a it's, it's a symbiotic process. As we try to build some software that supports us, it changes us. If we try to build processes to support change, we change. And so this evolutionary process applies to the development team from the development organization and the client um, and to the software. And it's this weird kind of you know, sidewall thing that we are really building. And this digital revolution that uh, Dries is talking about today is really that. Every organization in the next, let's say, decade, who knows how long, will need to have some form of you know, digital DNA. They will need to start adapting and existing within the digital world and making sure that tools that they use can change. 
because we are entering a period of such rapid change that any business that wants to survive must be able to change quickly and cheaply. And so I hope that I can continue my explorations of how to make this change. And I hope that I can have some more conversations with other people and their experiences because I believe this is actually very important. I think Drupal has a very powerful role to play in this process of helping people understand change. Um, and it's far more than a technical process. It's, we might be talking about software, but really the software then changes the business. Our agile methodologies have influenced almost every part of society. And they are all about lowering the cost of change. Um, so yes, thank you very much. That's the end of the video. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't any time for uh, questions right now, but you can email me. Uh, if you can, tweet me. I may or may not respond. I use Twitter about once a year when I come to Google. Uh, so anyway, Green Man is my handle on Twitter. Uh, Green Man is quite positive. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, uh, the slide will be up on the Google Com site sometime soon. Um, I haven't looked at my own website for about three years, so definitely not there. Uh, I'll, I'll get onto my website sometime soon. <laughs>